Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us uh, today. I'm George Langell, Executive in Residence uh, with the MHA program at the Telfer School of Management. I welcome you to this uh, MHA conference uh, series presentation. It's my pleasure to introduce our topic for this particular event. Uh, it's an unusual topic in that we don't often relate um, the area of healthcare uh, to man marketing functions, marketing and sales. Why would we do that? We're not in, in a for-profit business. But I think you would all agree that increasingly the environment is such that with diminishing uh, revenues, with the importance of, uh, of the contributions of our community uh, to our healthcare infrastructure and our research, that it becomes so very important that we apply marketing functions and techniques uh, to our various healthcare organizations in order to properly position them. And although we talk about a collaborative systems orientation to healthcare, there is an element of positioning, of branding that is becoming um, very important as organizations move forward with our renewed healthcare system. We already have a considerable amount and growing amount of private enterprise within healthcare. I know as Canadians, we don't always want to admit that, but uh, we do have a very uh, large and growing sector uh, of private healthcare, which employs uh, marketing techniques as of now. And it's only a matter of time as the public sector um, uh, and the private sector merge that uh, we will see uh, the application of marketing techniques. So we're very fortunate uh, within that phenomenon to have two people today from the uh, Ottawa Hospital Foundation who are very expert in this transition that we're seeing uh, in our healthcare system and with marketing and fundraising. Uh, first of all, we have uh, Tim Kluke. Uh, Tim is the president and CEO of the Ottawa Hospital Foundation, uh, and it supports uh, obviously Canada's largest, uh, one of Canada's largest acute care hospitals. Uh, the, the foundation that he runs is consistently benchmarked as one of the most efficient and effective healthcare foundations in the nation, having received the Association for Healthcare Philanthropy's high performer status for the past eight consecutive years. Over the more than 30 years, uh, Tim has, uh, has had as a certified fundraising executive, um, he has held a variety of senior positions within organizations in the charitable sector on both sides of the 49th parallel. So he's experienced both the US and the Canadian health systems. Before joining the foundation in 2011, Tim was the president and CEO of the Royal Ottawa Foundation for Mental Health. He is a past president of the Association of Fundraising Professionals, the Ottawa chapter, and past faculty member of the Association for Healthcare Philanthropies, Madison Institute in Madison, Wisconsin. In 2015, he was named the outstanding fundraising professional in the Ottawa chapter of AFP, the highest professional recognition this organization bestows. And today he is leading the most ambitious fundraising campaign in the history of Eastern Ontario. The campaign to create tomorrow will help build a new campus of the Ottawa Hospital, fund world leading healthcare research and bring to Ottawa the most advanced patient centered hospital in the country. Quite a task. And it would only be given to a gentleman from the Valley Tim is a resident of Renfrew, where he was born and raised, ventured out, but came back as many of our uh, good healthcare professionals do. So Tim, thank you for, for joining us today. And I know that with you, we have Daniel Knox. Uh, Daniel, I don't know that will be directly involved in the presentation, but he will be assisting Tim in the Q&A section. Uh, Danielle is, uh, Daniel is the Director of Campaign and Executive Office um, of the Ottawa Hospital Foundation. 
And after nearly two decades working in charitable organizations in the greater Toronto area, Daniel returned to his hometown of Ottawa in 2018. He's thrilled to have the opportunity to lead the Ottawa Hospital Foundation's campaign office while supporting the CEO and senior team as the executive office lead. He has uh, nearly 20 years experience as a fundraiser and nonprofit leader, including several years focused on successful hospital campaigns with the Sunnybrook Foundation, William Osler Systems Foundation, Health System Foundation, and research campaigns with the Heart and Stroke Foundation and the Crohn's and Colitis Canada. After discovering his passion for the charitable sector, Daniel completed the fundraising management program at Ryerson University in 2004. As a volunteer, he has served as secretary treasurer and Gallo co-chair for Canada's largest LGBTQ plus festival, as well as board member and sponsorship lead for Toronto's Pan American Food Festival. So I think you would agree with me, these two gentlemen have an extensive and welcomed experience in this whole area and this theme for today's presentation. And I would ask Tim to take over from here and lead us through the presentation and remind you again that we will be entertaining your questions on the Q&A function, um, which we will then uh, uh, use at the end of the presentation. So Tim, you're on. Thanks, George. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us uh, this afternoon. So uh, once again, the most stressful part of my day will be to uh, share my screen, but I think we will uh, be successful. So let me do that uh, now. We see the full presentation. Thank you. Excellent. Well, just, uh, just to pick up on what George said, absolutely uh, thrilled to be here today. And, and uh, thank you to all of you brave souls for agreeing to attend yet one more Zoom meeting today. So it's, uh, it's not lost on me that it, it is the end of the day, uh, but really grateful that uh, you've taken the time to, uh, to join us today. Uh, what I would, uh, would also say, you know, I'm coming from my, my home office, so at, at any time I may be uh, interrupted by uh, a 12 month old yellow lab or a golden doodle or a teenage daughter. So I apologize in advance uh, if it gets a little bit sidetracked. So really happy to, to share a little bit uh, about the kind of journey we're on at the Ottawa Hospital. And as George mentioned, uh, in Canada in particular, you don't necessarily think of branding and marketing when you talk about our healthcare system. But what I'd like to share this afternoon is kind of our approach that we took at the Ottawa Hospital a number of years ago and how that was in the marketing sphere, how that was a precursor to us launching in the next uh, few months. Uh, our largest and most significant healthcare infrastructure project in our lifetime. So it is uh, indeed an exciting, exciting time for us. And I, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, acknowledge George Langell. Uh, George, as many of you may know, is a former CEO of the Royal Ottawa uh, Healthcare Group and was a real pioneer in mental health leadership. Uh, not only in Ottawa, but across the country and, and very, very active and a big part of, of why uh, the Royal is positioned the way it is today. So I want to acknowledge uh, the time as well that I, I spent with George uh, when he was the CEO of the Royal. So again, it's my pleasure to walk through uh, today's presentation and I look forward to your questions and comments at the end. So for those of you that, that aren't necessarily uh, situated in Ottawa, I wanted to give you a sense of the size and scope of, of the Ottawa Hospital. And we are you know, one of the largest, if not the largest hospital in Canada when it comes to patient volume. And when we think of Eastern Ontario, significant uh, uh, footprint uh, coverage for our care, over 1.3 million people, and we are a hub for many of the, the tertiary specialty care that happens within our region. And on the screen, you'll see a few of those, whether it's our cancer center, 
uh, or say neuroscience program and other key regional specialty services. Uh, the Ottawa Hospital and, and one of the areas and reasons that we market as well is we're not well known from a research perspective. And if we look at the rankings of the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute, depending on the year, depending on which grants come in and the timing, we will be either the third or the fifth largest research institute in Canada. And you know, usually second only to uh, sick kids in Toronto and the University Health Network, and then we'll toggle between Hamilton and McGill. So, you know, great, uh, great city of Ottawa, and a real commitment to research. And I think we uh, punch well above our weight in terms of, of research. And I would say also, you know, a leader, emerging leader in the area of technology and innovation. And we have a very strong innovation platform that those of you locally will begin to hear about, hear more about. Uh, over the course of the next number of months as we uh, we plan to move forward with a major investment uh, in this area. So, you know, I started uh, in this business 30 years ago and, and started in kind of a bit of a non-traditional way, but I, I joined a consulting company out of the US uh, who just focused solely on capital campaigns. And I remember at that time, you know, very committed to kind of old school fundraising. And, and we always said that uh, fanfare and marketing doesn't raise money. And, you know, here I am 30 years later talking about the importance of marketing as it relates to transformative philanthropy. And as we sat back at the Ottawa Hospital and it again reflected on, on the, the type and kinds of communication that's happening uh, with our largest hospital. Yeah, we kind of had a, a website that, that is kind of out of date on old technology. Uh, and we were quite responsive. You know, we were focusing more on maybe government relations, internal communications, crisis communications, putting fires out rather than, you know, uh, making the ground fertile for, for when those, uh, those downtimes come. So as a foundation, uh, this was really born with a change of staff. And Dr. Jack Kitts and I looked at the opportunity to invest in, in two leaders. You know, one leader that would bring marketing expertise and another leader that would focus on say internal communications, crisis communications, and, and government relations. So as a foundation, we hired a VP marketing who would have overall responsibility of marketing the Ottawa hospital in the community. And, and so we made that, uh, that commitment to beginning the work of building and establishing a brand presence in the Ottawa community. And as I, I say on the screen, it really started with that alignment between the hospital and the foundation and you know, me as the CEO of the foundation and Dr. Kitts as the CEO of the hospital. And I, I say here, you know, hospitals have traditionally been very poor marketers. And those of you in healthcare administration know that budgets are increasingly tight and uh, departments like your communications and public relations uh, are usually squeezed. And the notion of investing uh, dollars that could be going to, towards patient, patient care in communication and marketing, it just really traditionally has not happened. And you've seen kind of nationally where other foundations, say foundations like Sick Kids in Toronto, where their foundation plays a major role in marketing uh, care and research and positioning uh, Sick Kids in the community. So let me begin by talking a little bit about philanthropy and you, know, you might ask yourself, well, why philanthropy? You know, healthcare in Canada is, uh, is funded by our tax dollars and, and that's what I'm paying for. And what I would say is, is what you're paying for is the standard of care. Absolutely, the funding from the province provides uh, that standard of care that, that institutions strive for. But I believe the role philanthropy can play is to take that care to another level. 
to allow institutions to invest in the, in the latest and greatest technology, allow institutions to invest in, in new equipment, innovative equipment, uh, and to support research and education because traditionally those areas are not supported by, by the ministry. And what we found is if, if we can have great facilities, we can conduct great research, we can also recruit great leaders to come to Ottawa and in particular in our case, to come to the Ottawa hospital to practice medicine. And uh, I, I think if you can have the, the kind of the, the, the pillars of facilities, equipment and research in a very li livable city like Ottawa, uh, our city should be a powerhouse in terms of healthcare delivery. So philanthropy is big business. You know, as we say here on the slide, over $14 billion is contributed uh, in Canada annually by individuals and corporations in Canada. And primarily the, the, that the lion's share of those funds go to four causes. Religion, which still remains uh, significant, health, social service, and international organizations. So if you look at, in Canada, I think we're probably pushing 90,000 uh, charitable organizations. So competition for the philanthropic dollar is also very significant and very real. So looking at academic med uh, medical centers, so how, how do they use donor dollars that are contributed uh, we participate through the Association for Healthcare Philanthropy on a report, report on giving survey each year. And I'm just sharing last year's results. So if you look at on aggregate, the hospitals that are academic medical centers, uh, it's about a 50-50 split how we spend donor dollars. And this kind of mirrors us as a foundation at the Ottawa Hospital as well. About 50% for research and then a split between capital and program support. Uh, as, as many of you, you know on, on the call today is that the government doesn't uh, support research in their base, bun, uh, base budgeting to the Ottawa Hospital. So our research institute relies heavily on support from the community as matching the grants that they're achieving through uh, their peer review process. But it, philanthropy is a critical aspect of, of advancing research uh, at the Ottawa Hospital. So if we look at, at Ottawa, just to give a little bit of, of size and scope in Ottawa uh, with our major healthcare institutions, there's about $120 million annually contributed in Ottawa, so that's cash. And I would just kind of point out uh, in the case of, of CHEO, uh, their numbers also reflect uh, parking revenue and, uh, and their very successful lottery revenue. But you can see uh, very significant contributions by our community who place a great emphasis on healthcare. And uh, you know, this is just a snapshot of one year. And we know each year, this kind of community support is duplicated, if not, not increased. So I, I just wanted to, to touch a little bit now on, on the hospital and philanthropy and, and who owns what. And I guess I would start by saying the Ottawa Hospital, the Ottawa Hospital Board, management, own the brand of the Ottawa Hospital. And as I say, they own it in good times and in bad. And if we provide excellent care, if we provide less than excellent care, it impacts the brand of the Ottawa Hospital. But the Ottawa Hospital owns the brand. And the work of the foundation uh, is that, that we assist in marketing that brand. Also, the hospital plays the role of setting the philanthropic priorities. And what we don't do as a foundation is decide that we're going to raise, raise funds for specific initiatives. We do this in partnership with the Ottawa Hospital and they set the stage and we follow from a philanthropic standpoint. And those of you, I've added the, uh, the third bullet, those of you considering a career in, uh, in the healthcare sector, I've added the third bullet point because I believe hospital leadership can play a pivotal role in supporting the institution with your own philanthropy. It sends a very powerful message 
to when we turn to the community and ask the community to support the hospital, knowing that the leadership is already involved. We, uh, we work with a joint committee to set the priorities. As I said, led by the hospital, but we have something called our Fundraising Policy and Priorities Committee. And this is a vetting process internally that allows the research priorities, the care priorities, the equipment priorities to come to one table. And that's where it flashed out. We are sitting at that table as well as the foundation. And, and this is a group that consists of hospital CEO, research CEO, the CE, the CFO of the hospital and the research institute, et cetera. So this is a, a core group that, that makes the decisions on where we're going to invest the community support donor dollars. So right now, as George mentioned in the intro, it's a pretty exciting time. And, and it was kind of clear to identify what our main priority is at the Ottawa Hospital. And uh, this is a view of, of 100 years ago. And if you're looking closely at this picture, you'll see in the screen uh, top right, I guess, where there's an individual wearing a mask. And uh, this is during the Spanish flu. And it was at the time of the Spanish flu pandemic that uh, leadership in Ottawa said we need a new big city hospital. And the plans were put in place to build the civic hospital at that time. You probably can't read what's on that individual's uh, sign, but I thought, you know, we don't have social media, but back in the day, a hundred years ago, this gentleman's uh, sign says, wear a mask or go to jail. So I thought that was, uh, that was pretty, uh, pretty interesting to, uh, to see that uh, we had our anti-maskers back uh, 100 years ago as well. So that's an exciting time. The community raised $3.5 million. They helped build the existing civic as it's known today. So it served us well. It served us well. It's been an exceptional hospital. It's, uh, it has provided uh, you know, dutiful service over many, many years. And uh, we're really excited about, uh, about this new chapter. So the existing civic, you know, I, I won't go through a lot of detail, but you know, 100 years old, it's not designed for modern healthcare. There are actually 21 buildings that are, have been pieced together over that 100 years. You can all really imagine the inefficiency of heating, of cooling, just the, the environmental inefficiency of, of that building. And as, as the photograph, the ad on the side said, isn't it time that uh, the building matches the capability of our people? And we certainly believe that to be true. So this is the new site that we're planning for the Ottawa Hospital at the corner of Preston and Carling Avenue, a 50 acre site that is going to be a purpose built site for the new campus. And uh, as of today, a city council has approved their master plan that so we continue to, uh, to move full speed ahead. So big vision, bold vision, uh, kind of by the numbers, we're looking at 2.5 million square feet, almost double the size of the existing Pacific. The overall cost is $2.8 billion. The government commitment is 2.1. And I'm gonna talk a little later about something called local share, but this, there is a gap of $700 million 
as part of our obligation as the Ottawa Hospital. And then, of course, our campaign, which is uh, the largest campaign in the city. So when you look at building a hospital and working with the ministry, there are, are five key stages. And it starts with kind of our pre-cap submission, our proposal and the, the master plan is stage one. We move into the functional programming. And this is where we, we just completed uh, stage two and we're just entering stage three. So a very critical time for us as we start to see the, uh, the hospital come alive and some of these early design elements uh, that will look at, at you know, the integration of the programs, uh, how people experience the site, the layout, the des design. Moving on stage four to our, our contracts. So now I'm into roughly 2023, uh, 24 construction starts with an end game goal to be in the hospital early in 2028. So pretty significant process, but very protracted. Uh, it is prescribed process that we're following in partnership with the ministry. This project is on Infrastructure Ontario's priority list. And uh, as I said today, pretty happy with, uh, with the ministry today and their, uh, sorry, the uh, council today and their approval. So one of the themes in, in my, my talk this afternoon is, is about partnership and the foundation working closely with the hospital. So we, we started a plan for our campaign probably about four years ago and doing much of the behind the scenes work. But we always wanted to ensure that our plans were in lockstep with the hospital's approval process and the hospital's planning process. So as we walk through what is what is a fundraising campaign timeline, you know, we recruited our chair back in 2000 and uh, just before, uh, sorry, 2018, 19, and began to recruit our executive for the campaign just as uh, as the pandemic hit in 2020. And our plan is then to launch publicly this coming spring. So we have been in what's called uh, the quiet phase of fundraising now for a couple of years and, uh, and going you know, exceptionally well and very pleased with the, uh, the community's response. But again, our planning mirrors that of the hospital. So again, by the numbers, but speaking about, about what's called local fits, there's a gap between the cost and, a, and what the government will fund. So essentially, there are elements of a new hospital build that is 100% government. Things like planning, design, financing, some of the, the financing costs associated with that. Then there's shareable costs, which typically is a 90-10 split in terms of the government and the hospital. Things like certain areas of construction, et cetera, et cetera. Then there's, there's costs that are have to be borne by the host institution. So it has to be borne by the hospital. Things like parking, uh, any space that's revenue generating, uh, research space, et cetera. And when we kind of shake it all down together, it works out to be about a 75-25 split. So the hospital is responsible for 25% of the costs associated with, it, with the build. So again, that's that $700 million gap typically across the country is raised through parking revenues, is maybe revenue model through the, uh, through the, the facility in terms of say retail and other business offerings. Uh, philanthropy and fundraising is a critical aspect. And then usually there's a, a contribution of some kind by the municipalities. And that's been the experience Across, uh, across the country. And then of course, there's a financing element that the hospital would, uh, would, assist, would enter into uh, to kind of close, close the gap. So we then said, given this kind of bold vision, how are we going to achieve this as a foundation? And we recognized at the time that, that while you know, the Ottawa Hospital uh, was respected in the community, uh, but we felt it needed to be repositioned. You know, those of you that are from Ottawa recognize that 
people don't really know what makes up the Ottawa Hospital. Does it include Queensway Carleton? Does it include Montfort? So we uh, we endeavored then to, to kind of build a marketing team within the foundation, and we started to, to hire and build up a marketing expertise within our team, and uh, and developed our multi year multi year plan. So the first thing, and this is kind of the, obviously the marketing segment of, of what I want to talk about, but we, we started by engaging stakeholders, uh, did some surveying, et cetera, to, to understand how we're going to position the brand in the community. And this, what you're seeing on the screen isn't something that, that was pub is public facing, but it was kind of our internal planning to, to really understand how we're going to position the organization and to reflect how we want to be perceived in the community. And this would be the basis to give uh, direction to our creative development, to all of our marketing and communications. And if you can see in the outer ring, the ready reaching in there for you. To this day today, when we tell a story in the community, any of our patient stories, any of our stories that feature physicians, we always drive them back to this positioning. Are they emphasizing that we're reaching, we're there for you, uh, or that uh, we're ready to, re you know, to receive the most challenging cases? So we, we, we developed a, uh, a five-year marketing plan that, that was developed by our VP Marketing, Fiona Charlton and her team. And it was presented uh, to our foundation board 100% funded by our foundation board. And I, I wanna emphasize the foundation may be leading this, but we're not marketing the foundation. We only market the Ottawa hospital. 99% of the cases, the foundation, the, the, it's only the hospital logo that appears. So we are not marketing our foundation, we're marketing uh, the brand of the Ottawa hospital. So we are in year four of a five-year plan and, and really started to, again, refine our position, increase our brand equity in the community, and then lead into how can this help us increase revenue and raise more money. So these are the kind of five key pillars that we built. We focused initially on doing some of the basics, getting the basics right, uh, so improving our current capabilities, we then worked with the hospital, the hospital board, foundation board, and we launched a new brand and then launched an integrated marketing campaign. And now we're getting ready to begin to speak more about philanthropy and introduce as we go public in our campaign uh, to introduce an asking element to our marketing, uh, marketing efforts. And again, building the Ottawa Hospital as, as a charity of choice. So this is a really busy slide. You, you won't be able to see it from your vantage point, but I wanted to emphasize that all of those brand attributes that we developed in the early days of our research, we continue to test against. So this, uh, this one slide is a result of the Ipsos Read work that uh, they were engaged to do for us. We did it initially in 2017-18. And then again, uh, we did it in 2021. And what's great to see is we can measure the impact that we're making. So while the words are hard to follow, if you look at the blue dots, so blue dots represent our most recent survey, we have moved almost all of the, uh, the brand attributes of the Ottawa Hospital. And some, some significantly, you know, moving 10 points on attracting the brightest and most capable doctors in the world to come to, to, come to Ottawa. Is a leader in research is another critical thing. I opened up by saying a lot of people didn't understand the Ottawa Hospital is, is invested in research. So while we're marketing, it's not marketing for marketing's sake. We measure what we market. Uh, it's a key part of what we do and we use outside sources like Ipsos, and we're just getting ready again to go back, uh, back to market. So 
in order to continue to tell our story, we also started to invest in some key assets, key materials to, in these cases, kind of support our conversations we are having in the community with community leaders and, uh, and donors. So we have our case for support, various one pagers, a lookbook, uh, impact report. So a number of key elements uh, that we started to tell the story in, in the community. So here are some examples of, of materials. You know, we, we really work with the hospital to, to have branding elements throughout the hospital. We then began to move from in-house in to outside of the house with things like transit. Uh, we also have a, in partnership with CTV Ottawa, we have a TV ad that's playing and it's just not kind of a, a one hit uh, strategy. There are many strategies from transit, et cetera, to bus shelters, uh, to, you know, social of course is, uh, is a huge part of what we do. So again, I just want to share, you know, some of the look and feel of some of our materials. Uh, and again, we're testing uh, different ads with different taglines with, different people, people looking at the camera, people not looking at the camera. So it's a pretty sophisticated group we have in our marketing department. And uh, it, it just under, underscore the message that, that it is embedded with research and uh, performance. Again, some of the materials that are, are supporting, supporting our work. And again, carrying through. Some of our materials. So, you know, I just want to just take a couple moments and, and, and pause to, to recap a little bit is that, you know, we, we felt as an organization that we needed to ensure the message of the Ottawa Hospital was out into the community that allowed us the opportunity to follow it with some solid uh, fundraising messaging. And we believed that not only the expertise wasn't there, but the kind of marketing spend that was required to really move the needle, uh, we felt that's the leadership we would take from the Ottawa Hospital Foundation. And you know, I've shared some of the results to date of, um, of kind of that public perception of the Ottawa Hospital. But what I want to emphasize is the partnership that occurs between the hospital and its foundation. And they are uh, integrally linked together. Uh, both of my participation on the hospital senior management team, but the plans that we built to market the Ottawa Hospital were done in partnership with the hospital. And, and as, as I mentioned, we are not advancing the Ottawa Hospital Foundation but rather we're advancing the Ottawa Hospital. And as the Ottawa Hospital moved through the planning process for this uh, major hospital, major investment, we as a foundation have to make a commitment. You know, I had to sign a letter uh, a couple of years ago that committed us to being to what we would raise and contribute as part of the local fair. And we continue throughout this quiet phase of our fundraising campaign, we continue to update and inform the ministry on our progress to date. And what I would say too uh, is that we have been absolutely humbled by the support of our donor community. You know, we will you know, announce this campaign announcing uh, many of the largest gifts ever contributed in this city and, and I think really demonstrating the community's commitment to this project and the commitment to, uh, to the Ottawa Hospital. So we've, uh, things are going well and uh, you know, the hospital is well aware of our plans as we work uh, in close collaboration. So George, maybe I will stop there and uh, I'll stop sharing my, uh, my screen if I can figure out where I do that. There we go. Thanks so much, Tim. That was uh, that was great. Thanks for sharing that information. Um, I know it uh, is generating a lot of interest in our community. 
and the community that I'm involved with academically, um, I think, you know, has every opportunity to take full advantage of this once in a lifetime experience in terms of uh, healthcare marketing and, and leadership that you and your team are exhibiting. Um, we do have, uh, from our registration, we have um, one question, but before we do that, I just again urge our participants uh, to use the Q&A function to provide us with uh, questions that we can ask both Tim and Daniel uh, that are of interest to you. But the question we've had that came in with the registration is as follows. If hospitals actively solicit and rely on donations, isn't, the, isn't this a way for provincial governments to abdicate their responsibilities? Taxes are supposed to pay for hospitals. That's why long-term care facilities have been a disaster. Because eons ago, our elder care was quietly moved out of a hospital-like, hospice-like care. So that uh, obviously uh, is one of the sentiments I'm sure that you've come across in, in a variety of, uh, of your uh, ventures. So how do you respond to something like that? Yeah, I think I would go back to, and, and it comes up, it comes up infrequently, typically. Now, I'm probably speaking to the converted because I generally talk with our donors. Uh, so people who are grateful and see the impact that their donations are making. I get it. You know, in Canada, we all pay our taxes. We all, uh, you know, have the, the, I wouldn't call it a luxury, but we do have, uh, our publicly funded healthcare system. And you're right, I think that, that you know, the basics of healthcare are provided by the ministry and that is what the base budget of the hospital does. It supports uh, the standard of care. And you know, the example I will give could be debated in terms of, of outcomes, but I'll give you an example of, you know, we had a leader in the community who had prostate cancer. And this individual uh, had the means. They went down to the US and had their prostate surgery done by robot. Came back to Canada, came back to Ottawa and said, we need a robot in Ottawa because I don't want anybody to have to travel outside of this city. And again, the results of open surgery versus robotic, but that individual you know, committed a seven figure gift and went out and raised the remaining dollars to bring that technology to Ottawa. So the standard of care is open surgery, 100%. And that's, that's what's funded from the hospital based budget. But to bring in technology, to bring in the latest technology, to invest in research that informs care, that helps recruit leading researchers and physicians to come to Ottawa to ensure that people in Ottawa, because we have a vibrant research institute, to ensure that people in Ottawa have access to the latest and greatest care, have access to clinical things, uh, novel therapies, et cetera. I think that's the impact that philanthropy can play. Tim, you, you did mention another level of government that has, uh, I guess, not so quietly in various communities, the municipal government uh, contributions to capital campaigns and local share. Is, is that becoming, I think you did mention it was becoming a trend that hospitals in many of our centers across Canada are looking to their municipal governments for support? Yeah, we did a bit of research that looked in, into other communities like Oakville and, and others. And when I talk about that local share in, in Oakville's uh, example, uh, the municipality in Oakville contributed $100 million towards building the new Oakville Hospital. And their local share was, was uh, how they achieved that local share was, there's my dog, sorry about that. <laughs> um, their local share was achieved similarly to what I outlined. It is parking revenue, it is, uh, uh, municipal support. And in the case of Oakville, they, uh, they sold a public utility, a hydro facility that allowed the municipality then to support the, the local hospital. 
But yeah, other communities, it's been things like waiving development charges and other fees associated with such a major redevelopment. And also, uh, in some cases, there have been uh, uh, kind of uh, levies that have been reached out to. Uh, I was just thinking with the LRT issues we have in Ottawa, that that would be helping parking revenues in the long run. <laughs> That's anyway. Right. We have a question here from Andrew Lowe. Uh, good evening and uh, thank you. Uh, I just lost the question, sorry. Yes, um, Andrew is saying good evening and thank you very much for taking your time. When you were referring to philanthropy revenue from the community, is that mainly from grassroots or large donors? And how does the breakdown compare with Toronto, for example? Yeah, so I think, you know, a great, great question. Um, you know, we're very blessed at the Ottawa Hospital where we, you know, we have about 80,000 contributions to the hospital each year and all are, are super meaningful, whether it's through our direct mail program or through events or through te telemarketing. And, uh, but if you look at typically large hospital-based foundations and you take our, our example, the lion's share of funds that we raised are, are typically of say gifts of $10,000 or greater that will, will make up uh, the lion's share of contributions. So I would say it, it is larger contributions where, where we're working with families and individuals who wanna make a real difference with their philanthropy, have a great connection to cause and are looking at, at making a tremendous impact. So that's where we really spend a great deal of our time in working uh, with those families and individuals. And it is, I should add, George, it is also the most effective way to raise money and the most cost effective. And one of the reasons why we are so efficient as a charity is we're focused in that area. We do fewer events, uh, you know, we, we really don't do many special events just because of the return on investment is, is not high. Daniel? Uh, yes, and I'll just add to that, Tim, um, just in terms of numbers, because uh, some, some of the attendees may be interested in that. Uh, when we began planning in earnest in 2018 um, for our campaign and, and how that would be playing out over the next several years, um, our forecasting accounts for about 70% of what we raise is likely to come from major gifts, as Tim said, $10,000 plus. Another 20%, um, mostly because we're also a hospital and very fortunate to be the recipient of, of them, is, is planned gifts. So typically gifts left in estates, um, hospitals, religious charities, and, uh, and animal-based charities typically do the best amongst um, uh, being recipient of, of planned gifts, and then about 10% from the community, so through events or annual fund. Um, our focus during this quiet phase has primarily been on those top level donations, but once we launch our campaign publicly, uh, we will focus more on, on a community-based campaign and ensuring that, you know, the $100 donation is extremely important as well in, in terms of getting us towards our goal. We have another question here. Um, congratulations on a successful campaign to date. Uh, what is the investment made by the foundation into brand and marketing as a percentage of your campaign goal? And given the hospital owns the brand, did they contribute to the development of the brand financially? And why or why not? So I guess there's two questions in there. Uh, the first one on the percentage of, of the branding and marketing exercise in terms of uh, I suppose getting at that expense threshold, how yes. much do you spend to yeah. uh, get a dollar? So I would I would say our our marketing budget is in multiple millions. Um, that includes people and direct uh, marketing expense, such as ad placement and and uh, material development, new website, all of all of those tools. So I would, you know, I don't have the number in front of me. I would say over the five-year plan, it's it's in the neighborhood of $5 million. So, but if you look at the overall cost of conducting our campaign, which includes marketing costs, including all of the elements of the foundation, be it gift receiving, et cetera, et cetera, 
uh, you know, our cost is well below kind of industry average over the life of our campaign, it will cost us 18 cents uh, cost to raise a dollar. So it would be very low um, when you compare it to, uh, to other, other organizations. That are oh, so the other part of the question was, uh, did the hospital contribute? Uh, I would say financially in a nominal way, uh, but we work again very collaboratively with the found with the with the hospital. But I would say the well the lion's share of financial support to backstop the marketing program came from the foundation. Okay, we have a, a question here from uh, Claude Baudouin. And Claude is asking, is the line between fundraiser and pay for service blurring? Should Canada be allowing modest payment for advanced medical services? Pretty profound question at a very political level in Canada. <laughs> I'm sure you gentlemen must have some thoughts on that. I you say, I was gonna turn that question to answer over to you, George. You, you, uh, <laughs> uh, listen, uh, I, I'm surrounded by people who have, an ex, who have experiences with other healthcare systems other than Canada and often press us, you know, with the question, why can't we, you know, why can't we, you know, why, why isn't there a, another tier of service for those that wish to pay, not taking away from our publicly funded system. So any opinion I give on this would be, Tim Klukes and not the Ottawa Hospital, but you know, but but my view is, uh, I really think increasingly um, we should be looking at at services that could be managed effectively within the private sector, that has the same responsibility for reporting and re and uh, recording to that uh, standard of care. But that's my own personal view. Well, you know, it's interesting. I will just give a two cent uh, response uh, to that question, too, is um, government's approach, particularly provincial governments, has not been so much to open the door for this, but to move services out of the hospital into the community uh, to survive as private enterprise would on their own. So many of our ambulatory services have traditionally moved into the community, physiotherapy, uh, psychosocial services, and so on. And people now have to pay for those or find a funding stream that will help uh, offset their costs. So, you know, that's been the traditional approach, I think, that governments have employed rather than looking, as many other governments have, at ways that the public-private funding issue and uh, operations issue can be better balanced to assist in the public support of the public system. So my two cents were. The, the other question I have is, um, we hear a lot these days about uh, shortages of human resources. We're hearing it about in healthcare, we're hearing it in the retail industry, we're hearing it right across the board that there are shortages of staff that are impacting the ability to operate to deliver services as expected. Um, is that impacting you in terms of the skill sets that you look for? Would be the first part of my question. And secondly, would you see opportunities here uh, for young graduates, uh, MHA graduates, MBA graduates um, who have that uh, training in marketing and, and in the MHA sense, both marketing and healthcare management. Are there opportunities there for, for young people that are looking at careers in healthcare to look at this fundraising stream, this marketing stream? You know, I, I would, I, first of all, I would say absolutely. And those of you that, uh, that are, are considering your career, career opportunities, Myself, uh, I was a business, uh, I'm a business marketing grad, uh, first started out in an advertising agency in Toronto, and, uh, and then kind of graduated into, into the charitable sector. Um, and that was, that was early days in, in healthcare philanthropy. And healthcare philanthropy back at that time, 
traditionally was something that was managed by the hospital's public relations coordinator. You know, he or she uh, typically had some fundraising or maybe did a little special event over here. And, and then, then the profession grew and you started to see over time professional associations come into play, certification come into play. And now you're seeing university programs, uh, degree programs, et cetera, that, that, that now exist for our sector. So I would say absolutely, you know, it is, it's a very rewarding career, but it's also a business, right? If you take, uh, you know, Daniel and I, our roles, uh, I report to the board of directors. We have, you know, over a hundred million dollars in management uh, as an endowment fund, as investments. You know, our revenue of approximately $40 million each year with a staff of, of 60. So it is a business, you know, and, and we are governed by a board of directors, uh, most of whom are senior business leaders and expect their foundations to be run like a business. So it's a tremendous opportunity to kind of flex your business muscles, but also, uh, you know, kind of have that pride of association with causes that are meaningful to you. And in this particular case, uh, the healthcare system. And you know, we all have a connection back to, to great healthcare. So, so if I look at even MHA students, as you begin to understand healthcare and, and how hospitals are, are run, uh, that's a great asset. If you kind of turn to the fundraising side of the house where you're talking to donors who may have questions about healthcare, uh, you know, you'll be better equipped and well equipped to, uh, to, to talk to them and, and work out uh, their questions and interests. Heather may be knocking on your door uh, to see if you'd take a resident next year who's interested in this area. We do have an interesting question that has come up here that I think is a, your segue to that is, is good that what can a smaller healthcare organization, which doesn't have the marketing team resources or a foundation like the Ottawa Hospital, do to move forward to implement a philanthropic campaign? Yeah, so you know, if, if I was out meeting with a, a smaller organization or a small town hospital that's, that's looking at, uh, um, at, at developing a fundraising program, I think where I would start would be developing kind of your case for support, you know, your raison d'etre, uh, creating a document that kind of outlines what your vision is and, and, and then articulates the impact that the community will have should they choose to, to support you. Then I would look at, at uh, you know, and, and I, would, I would take advantage of organizations like the Association of Fundraising Professionals or the Association of Healthcare Professionals and even participate in their mentorship program. So kind of create that buddy to have a seasoned executive who could come back and maybe uh, on a volunteer basis provide you with some counsel. But it would start with developing your case, your messaging, uh, clearly articulating why you need support from the community and then look at the opportunities to fundraise and what makes sense to you. You know, many smaller organizations have a tendency to conduct special events because it's kind of easy. It's what, uh, what the community will engage in. And it, it doesn't require a lot of sophistication in terms of support systems to, uh, to support it. But I think that's where I would start. Uh, I would also start by enlisting a core group of volunteers who are passionate about the cause and, uh, and invite them to, uh, to help you either by their own contributions, their own gifts, and then, and then in turn, asking them if they'd be willing to go out and meet with, with viewers with, within their natural network. Uh, so while we talk about major gifts and, and uh, how we raise the bulk of our money, organizations can do that on a smaller scale by attracting great volunteers, asking for their support, and asking them to help open the doors to three individuals. That's where I would start. Good, Daniel, with your extensive experience with a variety of organizations, do you have anything to add to that? 
I, I would just echo what Tim says, um, you know, starting out on a, on a smaller scale and, and also being honest with, with some of your senior leaders, volunteers and donors that, you know, you need to get something going. And, you know, perhaps in the first couple of years, you might spend a little more than you'd expected to on either building your brand or doing some marketing or, or taking a chance on a new program. And that could be the hardest thing to do. Uh, wasn't in my bio, but I've worked for a, um, a community organization that was always struggling for funding. And, you know, there were big decisions to be made uh, in spending any donor dollars, but making the case for how that how that spend can translate into larger donor dollars in the future um, is really something to be mindful of in dealing with, particularly with boards of directors who are, you know, uh, cautious with the finances. Thank you. Tim, I guess it begs the issue too. Um, are you the gorilla in the room? I mean, when it comes to, to fundraising, these smaller organizations, even some of the hospitals, for example, other than CHEO, where you, you put up the data on that. Um, and, and if you are, how do you deal with that? Or do you? So, yeah, you know, I met with somebody not that long ago, and we, we were talking about their organization, which is a, a much, much smaller organization. And, and I compared them to the Ottawa Hospital. One of the advantages of the Ottawa Hospital, especially to secure large and transformational gifts, is that we right now are blessed with having a big vision. And, and I think that, that unless you can articulate a big vision, you're not gonna secure leadership gifts. And, uh, and I know, so we're, we're very fortunate where we've got a tremendous research enterprise and we're building a new hospital, which is a big vision, but we're also working with the Ottawa hospital. What's the next vision? Like, where are we headed beyond this? We're not, we're not done uh, when we build this new hospital. Uh, so what I would say is the, the gorilla in the room, I think our project with many philanthropists people have known, especially our donors, they've been prepared for this campaign. They knew that we were going to have to go to campaign. And in some cases, uh, they may be, you know, they've deferred uh, their giving to other organizations. We're not asking people to do that. And they, our campaign chair, Roger Greenberg, has, has said that to many donors. We're not asking you to stop supporting organizations that are meaningful for you. We're asking you to recognize the importance of this and to consider doing this in addition to what you're already doing in the community. Okay, we have a question here uh, that, that reads, brand equals perception. How do you ensure a positive perception of the hospital amongst the community including patients and staff given continued challenges and issues in public health care delivery. And I would add to that during COVID. Yeah. So one of our one of our risks on the foundation's risk register is the, the impact of drinking services during COVID. You know, people, the inability of people to access services that have been restricted during COVID. It's a real, it's a real risk. And, and I would agree with, with the, the individual who asked the question. We can run ads all day long that won't make a difference if we're not delivering quality care and, and people are having a positive patient experience, full stop. And, and that's why I said at the start of the presentation, the Ottawa Hospital owns the brand, good and bad. And, and you know, it, it's, you know, your brand can be tarnished, uh, you know, by, you know, a, a, an experience in care, uh, a lack of access to services. Those are all, will, will impact significantly how you're perceived or believed to be in the community. Uh, and, and again, it, it's core, right? It's fundamental. It's, it's like, you know, you buy a pair of Nike running shoes, you expect that they're gonna be of a certain standard. And if they're not, um, you know, that's, you don't believe in their branding. 
So you mentioned a partnership being very, very important and central to the hospital's mission is, is research, teaching and research. So you've got the university, you've got community colleges that are big contributors and affiliated with the Ottawa Hospital and other hospitals as teaching hospitals. How does the foundation structure those partnerships to ensure not only your compatibility with the mission of the hospital, but that obviously from a research point of view, there's compatibility with the university, with the medical faculty, with the health sciences faculties of the community colleges, who are also fundamentally looking at research, and in the case of the colleges, applied research. So how do you how do you deal with that partnership? So I would say it's a work in progress. Um, but kind of our position at the Ottawa Hospital Foundation is the relationship with the university and the other partners needs to come from the host institution. So the leadership of the Ottawa Hospital uh, and the partners that you mentioned need to be working kind of collaboratively at the top and we'll follow. But it's very hard for us to try to, to go around that, usurp our, our role to, to try to take on collaboration at a fundraising level if we don't have direction from the leadership at the top around collaboration and uh, say joint initiatives, et cetera. Does that answer your question, George? I, I think so, but you know, again, the organization, let's take the University of Ottawa, which is affiliated with the Ottawa Hospital. They have their own foundation. In fact, I believe there's a fundraising arm of the medical faculty and the health sciences faculties. Uh, there seems to be you know, a lot of different streams going after what fundamentally would be the same dollar. Yeah. I just, I'm curious about what sort of cross fertilization, even sharing of information uh, to try to lead to at least, uh, you know, a common approach, like you mentioned with the neurosciences. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, we do reach out as a foundation to our peers at those institutions, and, the, and there are conversations that, that's happening, but we still rely on the medical leadership and the administrative leadership to provide the clarity for the foundation. Like I can't, I can't influence that clarity. Um, but I, I think Jim Orban may be on this, uh, on this call. And Jim and I, when Jim was at uh, the Heart Institute, we uh, bantied around an idea. And I, I always kind of said, this was kind of my, my vision for Ottawa. But maybe to your point, George, wouldn't it be wonderful if, institutions in the city of Ottawa, including, um, in, including the, the, the medicine faculty, that if we collaborated on establishing the philanthropic priorities of this community, that would have us focused on making Ottawa the best uh, healthcare city in the country. That, you know, it should, and therefore, you know, it's not who gets to the donor first, right? And you have your institutional kind of pet priorities. But if we could ever stand back as a city to say, what's going to make this city great? And, you know, the example I used was, if we need a seven Tesla MRI at the Royal for brain imaging, that's what this city needs. Well, then let's get behind that. And, and make Ottawa the best. So I, I would love to see more joint planning in particular so that philanthropists know they're having the greatest impact in their city, not just at one institution. I understand that the memorandum of understanding has been struck among the health research institutes and the University of Ottawa to do just that, yeah. to attempt to do that. So. That, uh, that is a very positive step forward, I would agree. So we, we have one final question that's just come in and then we'll wrap up. But 
What would you summarize as the most important factors in terms of marketing and positioning of the healthcare organization of the future? Appropriate question to end on. Yeah, I, I think it is. It is. You know, what do you want to be known for? And at a time of great bureaucracy, I think the opportunity to be known that you're nimble, that you're innovative, that you are investing in technology, that you're not uh, emboldened to the traditional old ways of, of doing the business. And, and you look at the impact of COVID and uh, all of the outpatient visits that are happening on Zoom calls and Teams calls, where you have people who you know don't have to rail out elder, elderly, leave their home, get a get a, a drive into the city, and stress about parking, and and come to a hospital for a routine visit or or a check in with a specialist. So I think I think we've we've forced the system to change a little bit. I know our vision for the new campus of the Ottawa Hospital. It's not about having everybody come to that campus. It's also about how do we ensure that people can get care outside of the hospital where they need it, where where care makes most sense to them. So I think I would I would focus on on innovation. I'd focus on technology. I would focus on treating patients uh, where they live and what is convenient for them uh, rather than just take a siloed institutional approach. Daniel, any, any final words from your vantage point to, in respect to that question? Uh, I think I would just add to what Tim said in terms of you know, what, what sets you apart and connecting that with, with stories of real people and patients. Because if we're looking at it from a philanthropic perspective, people give to people, um, not necessarily to a building. So that's what we've really tried to do is connect all of our great news about technology, innovation, and research back to how that, that impacts the people in our community. Well, on that note, um, let me thank both of you for being a part of this presentation, a very vital part of it, the center uh, of it. And, for the sharing that you did today. Um, I know that the students in the audience will benefit greatly from this perspective and the competencies that are evolving in your area of marketing applications and fundraising. Uh, in some ways today, you remind me of uh, William Shatner. <laughs> that uh, Captain- well, Spaced out, George. <laughs> <laughs> no, that you're venturing into new frontiers. Yeah. And you really are. And I want to thank both of you again, uh, not just for this, but for all the work you do to really uh, enhance our community, to make this a better community and improve community in terms of the delivery of health care. And so on that note, um, I wish both of you well. I, I thank you sincerely for being part of this. And, you know, who knows? Maybe there's a room in the MHA curriculum for something along these lines of marketing and healthcare yep. as the system changes. So thank you to both of you. Really enjoyed it. Thank you all. Appreciate uh, everyone for joining us today. Yeah, thank you to everyone who joined us. And thank you for the Telfer team who uh, put this together. Very much appreciated. Everybody have a great evening. Thank you.